morning. Uh, I think uh, as a grumpy Eastern European, I was brought in to play as a pessimist this morning. Uh, so bear with me. Well, I come from the former Soviet Republic of Belarus, uh, which, as some of you may know, is not exactly an oasis of liberal democracy. <laughs> So that's why I've always been fascinated with how technology could actually reshape and open up authoritarian societies like ours. So on graduating college and feeling very idealistic, I decided to join an NGO which actually was using new media to promote democracy and media reform in much of the former Soviet Union. However, to my surprise, I discovered that dictatorships do not crumble so easily. In fact, uh, some of them actually survived the internet challenge and some got even more repressive, right? So this is when I ran out of my idealism, decided to quit my NGO job and actually study how the internet could impede democratization. And I must tell you that this was never a very popular argument. And it's probably not very popular yet with some of you sitting in this audience. It was never popular with many political leaders, especially those in the United States, who somehow thought that new media would be able to do what missiles couldn't, that is, promote democracy in difficult places where everything else has already been tried and failed. And I think by 2009, this news has finally reached Britain. So I should probably add Gordon Brown to this list as well. Uh, however, you know, there is an underlying argument about logistics, which has driven so much of this debate, right? So if you look at it close enough, you'll actually see that much of this is about economics. The cyber-utopians say, much like fax machines and Xerox machines did in the 80s, blogs and social networks have radically transformed the economics of protest. So people would inevitably rebel, right? So to put it very simply, the assumption so far has been that if you give people enough connectivity, if you give them enough devices, democracy would inevitably follow. Right? And to tell you the truth, I never really bought into that argument, in part because I never saw three American presidents agree on anything else in the past. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you know, even beyond that, if you think about the logic underlying it, it's something I call iPod liberalism, right? Well, we assume that every single Iranian or Chinese who happens to have and love his iPod will also love liberal democracy. <laughs> and again, I think this is kind of false. But I think a much bigger problem with this is that this logic that we should be dropping iPods, not bombs, I mean, it would make a fascinating title for Thomas Friedman's new book. <laughs> but this is rarely a good sign, right? <laughs> so uh, the bigger problem with this logic is that it confuses the intended versus the actual users of technology. So those of you who think that new media of the internet could somehow help us avert genocide, should look no further than Rwanda, where in the 90s it was actually two radio stations which were responsible for fueling much of the ethnic hatred in the first place. Right? But even beyond that, coming back to the internet, what you could actually see is that authoritarian governments have mastered the use of cyberspace for propaganda purposes. Right? And they're building what I call the spinternet. The combination of spin on the one hand and internet on the other. The governments from Russia to China to Iran actually hiring, training, and paying bloggers in order to leave ideological comments and create a lot of ideological blog posts to comment on sensitive political issues. Right? So you may wonder why on earth are they doing it? Why are they engaging with cyberspace? Well, my theory is that it's happening because censorship actually is less effective than the thing it is in many of those places, right? The moment you put something critical on a blog, right, even if you manage to ban it immediately, it would still spread around thousands and thousands of other blogs, right? So the more you block it, the more it emboldens people to actually avoid the censorship and thus, you know, win in this cat and mouse game. Right? So the only way to control this message is actually to try to spin it and accuse anyone who's written something critical of being, for example, a CIA agent. 
And again, this is happening quite often. Just to give an example of uh, how it works in China, for example. There was a big case uh, in February 2009 uh, called Elude the Cat. And for those of you who don't know, I'll just give a little summary. So what happened is that a 24-year-old man, a uh, Chinese man, died uh, in prison custody. And police said that it happened because he was playing hide and seek, uh, which is a little the cat in, in Chinese slang, with other inmates and hit his hat against the wall. Um, which was not an explanation which sat well with many Chinese bloggers. Uh, so they immediately began posting a lot of critical comments. In fact, QQ.com, which is a popular Chinese website, had 35,000 comments on this issue within hours. But then authorities did something very smart. Instead of trying to purge these comments, they instead went and reached out to the bloggers. And they basically said, look guys, we'd like you to become net as an investigators. Uh, so 500 people applied and four were selected to actually go and tour the facility in question, right? And thus inspect it and then blog about it, right? Within days, the entire incident was forgotten which would never happen if they simply tried to block the content. People would keep talking about it for weeks, right? And this actually fits with another interesting theory about uh, what's happening in authoritarian states and on their uh, cyberspace. And this is what political scientists call authoritarian deliberation, right? And it happens when governments actually reaching out to their critics and letting them engage with each other online, right? We tend to think that somehow this is gonna harm these dictatorships but in many cases, it only strengthens them, right? And you may wonder why. I'll just give you a very short list of reasons why authoritarian deliberation may actually help the dictators, right? And first, it's quite simple. Most of them operate in complete information vacuum, right? They don't really have the data they need in order to identify emerging threats facing the regime. So encouraging people to actually go online and share information and data on blogs and wikis is great, because otherwise, low-level apparatchiks and bureaucrats will continue uh, concealing what's actually happening in the country, right? So from this perspective, having blogs and wikis produce knowledge has been great. Secondly, involving public in any decision-making is also great, because it helps you to share the blame for the policies which eventually fail. Because you say, well, look, we asked you, we consulted you, you voted on it, you know, you put it on the front page of your blog. Well, great. I mean, you know, you, you are the one who is to blame. And finally, uh, you know, the purpose of any authoritarian deliberation efforts is usually to increase legitimacy of the regimes, both at home and abroad. So inviting people to all sorts of public forums, having them participate in decision making, and uh, you know, it's actually great, because what happens is that then you can actually point to this initiative and say, well, we are having a democracy, we are having reforms. Just to give you an example, one of the Russian regions, for example, now involves its citizens in uh, planning its strategy up until year 2020. Right? So they can go online, contribute ideas on what the region would look like by the year 2020. I mean, anyone who's been to Russia would know that there was no planning in Russia for you know, next months. So having people involved in planning for 2020 is not necessarily going to change anything because the dictators are still the ones who control the agenda. Okay? Well, just to give an example from Iran, we all heard about the Twitter revolution that happened there. Right? But if you look close enough, we'll actually see that many of the networks and blogs and Twitter and Facebook were actually operational, right? They may have become slower, but activists could still access it. And I actually argue that having access to them is actually great for many authoritarian states, right? And it's great simply because um, they can gather open source intelligence, right? Uh, in the past, it would take you weeks, if not months, to identify how Iranian activists connect to each other. Now you actually know how they connect to each other by looking at the Facebook page. I mean, KGB, and not just KGB, used to torture in order to actually get this data. Now it's all available online. 
<laughs> but I think the biggest conceptual pitfall that uh, cyber utopians made is when it comes to digital natives, people who have grown up online. We often hear about cyber activism, how people are getting more active because of the internet. We rarely hear about cyber hedonism, for example, right? How people are becoming passive. Why? Because we somehow assume that the internet is going to be the catalyst of change that will push young people into the streets. Well, in fact, it may actually be the new open for the masses, which will keep the same people in their rooms downloading pornography. That's not an option that we have considered too strongly. So for every digital renegade that's revolting in the streets of Tehran, there may as well be two digital captives who are actually rebelling only in the world of Warcraft. And this is realistic, and there is nothing wrong about it, because the internet has greatly empowered many of these young people, and it plays a completely different social role for them. If you look at some of the surveys on how the young people actually benefit from the internet, you'll see that the number of teenagers in China, for example, for whom the internet actually broadens their sex life, is three times more than in the United States. So it does play a social role, however, it may not necessarily lead to political engagement. Right? So the way I tend to think of it is like a hierarchy of cyber needs in space, a total repo from Abraham Maslow. But the point here is that when you get the remote Russian village online, what will get people to the internet is not going to be reported on Human Rights Watch. It's going to be pornography, sex in the city, or maybe watching funny videos of cats. Right? So this is something we have to recognize. So what should we do about it? Well, I say we have to stop thinking about the number of iPods per capita and start, th start thinking about ways in which we can empower you know, intellectuals, dissidents, NGOs, and other members of civil society. Because given what has been happening up till now with the spent internet and certain deliberation, is there a great chance that those voices will not be heard? So I think we should shut off our cyber utopian assumptions and actually start doing something about it. Thank you.